time to put on your space suits because this is probably the closest David is going to get to interviewing an astronaut for episode 179 of the Sales Development Podcast. Quinn Folk, Director of Sales Development at Snowflake, a company that just IPO'd, a company that is an absolute rocket ship joins the show back for another fantastic episode of the sales development podcast powered by 10 bound hosted by david delaney my name is james bodden david wastes zero time in this episode kicking things off with quinn's journey into sales development how he got into the role at snowflake just incredible to hear that journey anybody that's looking to have a similar path definitely want to tune in as we kick things off at the 13 minute mark after going over snowflakes recruiting process david has quinn go over what onboarding looks like step by step what onboarding at a company like snowflake looks like for new sales development reps. At minute 26, David asks Quinn how to gauge where the true problem lies with struggling SDRs. A tough conversation, but some really fantastic insight from Quinn on how he handles that with his team. Going on to minute 36, they get into some very, very hot topics here. Cross-functional alignment, how Quinn handles it. That leads into a conversation about the effects of sales development rolling up into marketing. At minute 44, David and Quinn go over the importance of learning from the front lines. And Quinn makes such a great point about the moment you lose that touch with the front lines is the moment you lose your relevancy. Just such a great episode for anybody that wants to hear what modern sales development is all about at a company that is just on the rise, an absolute rocket ship that is Snowflake. So as always, if you enjoy this episode, feel free to leave us a review, leave us a rating, head over to 10bound.com. And with that, enjoy episode 179 of the Sales Development Podcast. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am joined today by Mr. Quinn Folk, Director of Sales Development over at Snowflake. How are you doing today, sir? I'm great, David. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. Thanks for coming on. I mean, there's just so much momentum behind what you're working on. I cannot wait to dive in. You know, Snowflake looks like it's just this rocket ship from the outside. So we want to get the inside scoop. How did you get into sales development and, you know, end up over at Snowflake? Yeah, solid question. So, you know, through most of my 20s, I did a lot of different blue collar sales. I was a ski bum for a while and I managed a business where we sold the photos at the top of Steamboat Mountain. And so I kind of got that sales itch doing everything from selling photos to selling windows and siding. I sold cars for a little bit. You know, I had one job where I was selling tax resolution services. So I was calling 400 people a day in businesses that were delinquent on their state or IRS taxes. So I got the bug and then are bit by the bug. And then I finally got my big break. I was on a ski lift actually with a friend named Mike Davis. And he was talking about how he worked for this tech company that was named Exactly. And they automated the calculation and tracking of sales commissions. And so since I had a background in sales, I could have a good conversation with him about sales comp and and motivating behavior. So he introduced me to their VP of sales and I, and I was grateful to be the eighth SDR at Snowflake. We scaled the Denver office to about 20 and, you know, about a, a year and a half into my time at exactly, I was at this juncture where I either go full cycle sales or there was a leadership path and having managed retail sales businesses, there was an appeal to the management path. And at that juncture, you know, I was aware that I was a little late to the sales path and that with all due respect, sales reps themselves are, are a dime a dozen, but there's not a lot of people that specialize in sales development. And then you add that to the fact that Denver was emerging as a hub for inside sales where, you know, companies were following the exactly model of building out satellite offices in Denver. You know, I took a look around and saw, hey, maybe this could be something that I could hitch my wagon to and really double down on sales development. 
So I went into leading a team. I did that for about a year. And then it came to the point where, you know, we went through an IPO and it was my time to go out on my own and build the SDR team from scratch. So I built out a team in the test automation space called Eggplant. And so I was building out a team in Boulder, Colorado and a team in London. So I got that international experience. That was a lot of fun. I briefly went into full cycle sales while I was at Eggplant and it was a, it was an eye opening experience where, you know, I had, I had a deal that kept on kicking out and, you know, after a few months, it finally, we finally brought it across the line. And my, my VP of sales was like, aren't you, aren't you excited? Like, don't you get that thrill? And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have the thrill at all. I felt relieved. You know, I didn't want to go to the bar. I wanted to, to go home, have a sandwich and take a nap. And so that was a moment where I realized, hey, like, you know, I don't get the rush out of bringing the whale across the line. But what I do get the rush out of is someone that comes from my sales development team going to the field and, and then bringing the deal across the line. I really get fired up about that. So, you know, I went to another company to, to build out a sales development team. It was kind of a miss. There was a lot of chaos there. And as luck would have it, I was at the same WeWork as someone that I had worked with at Exactly. And as, as it appeared that I, I wasn't going to stick it out at my, my current employer, I started networking with him to learn what they're up to at Snowflake. And, you know, from the outside looking in at the Snowflake Denver office this time, there was about 15 people, 11 SDRs. And it just seemed like the culture was off. I mean, the office was messy. And, and when you've been around sales teams enough, you can, you can kind of spot you can spot if it's got that beating heart, if it has that energy and it didn't. And so I asked him, I said, Hey, like if, if, if you're dying on a vine, if your SDR is not providing support, I'd be happy to take him out to lunch. And, and I think I can probably help. And he was, he was surprised. He was like, take him out to lunch. Like we, we need to hire a manager in Denver yesterday. So he introduced me to the VP of corporate sales, a gentleman by the name of Mark Winland. And we hit it off and he gave me the keys to the Lamborghini. And so I was responsible for scaling out the Denver office. So I started with a team of 11. We scaled out the Denver office of SDRs to about 35 at the peak. And then in that, we're both the revenue pipeline, but also the talent pipeline for the corporate sales org. So in my time at Snowflake in Denver, I want to say that we've promoted around 50 SDRs. And what I'm really proud of is that the rate at which we're promoting people is is at least 2x the rate that people are churning out of out of the org. And in sales development, you know, recruiting or retention is, is one, half the battle. And so if we can keep that ratio 2 to 3x promotion to churning, I think that we're doing a pretty good job. So now we're at a point, I've been through a handful of different global leaders. Right around the time I was hired at Snowflake, I was, I was blessed to roll up to a woman by the name of Nicolette Molinex. And Nicolette is just like a rock star in our world. And she brought some, she, she watches my blind side and she brought some scalable processes to the org. And I, and I learned a whole lot about, you know, the differences between the, my background in series A, series B, series C to, you know, building a scalable infrastructure at a, at a really large organization. And so now we're at a point where we're probably going to double the size of the SDR org going into next year. So globally we'll be, around 150 SDRs, close to 100 of those will be in North America. And I'm responsible for the eastern half of the United States. So SDRs in Denver and Atlanta offices that support our enterprise and major segment, as well as SDRs supporting the public sector. I like how you call it the revenue pipeline and the talent pipeline, because they're, they're kind of intermixed, right? So that's amazing, dude. So tell me about, I mean, there must be so much recruiting, onboarding, training, coaching? How do you stay ahead of it when all these people are getting promoted because things are going great or they're leaving the company? Yeah. I mean, David, I'm sure you've you've seen it at every company you come across. I mean, the recruiting retention is the most important part of my job and it's, it's nonstop. If we're doing our job right, then people are being promoted. If we're not doing as good of a job, people are being termed. And, you know, if we're, if I'm associating myself with the right organization, we're scaling. So when you're scaling at the same time as backfilling promotions, 
you got a big hill to climb. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. And the reason I am active is because it's, it's critical for the recruiting funnel. I probably get, I don't know, I want to say five to 10 people a week that reach out to me about jobs at Snowflake and maybe one or two of them flesh out. And so I view that as, as a core competency of my role is, is getting people interested in joining the organization. And then your, your question about like the different aspects of recruiting and training. I mean, it's one of the blessings of being at Snowflake is that we've been able to recruit a, a lot of different quality managers and we've gone through the process of, of having specialties. So we have one manager who's focused on onboarding. We have one manager who's focused on the ongoing playbook. We have another manager who's focused on recruiting and, and they put on the recruiting sessions. Then we have another manager who's focused on, you know, cross-functional alignment and partnership with the field. And so we really have to have trust. A lot of us have that background working at smaller organizations where you have to juggle everything. And so now we have to trust each other that, hey, someone else is going to run point on this project that I know really well, but I can't do that in addition to my project. And so that's, that's kind of where we're at right now is, is just figuring out how to play the management clubs in the bag for the right responsibilities. So interesting because, yeah, exactly. So if you're a SDR manager with like, you know, eight people, you're doing the onboarding, the playbook, the recruiting, the cross-functional relationship. You're kind of wearing all those hats, right? So what you've done is because you've been able to grow, each person has their specialty. Absolutely. And like, well, we, we, I mean, maybe team of rivals is too intense, but like there's dissenting opinions, and we try to foster an environment where people can disagree without being disagreeable. However, like to be scalable, we have to have someone that's that, you know, the buck stops there for the different responsibilities of the, of the org. Got it. And is there like a refresh, you know, cadence? And so if someone's in charge of onboarding, the playbook, the recruiting process, the cross-functional thing, how do you manage to, it's, it's like one huge project, but everyone's doing all these different things. How do you keep that whole thing on track? It's a good question. I mean, I don't think that we do it perfectly. Like you said, it's like a evolving projects. I think that when you find something that works, that you stick to that and you kind of take things off the plate that don't have to change. So for instance, in the COVID era, since we're doing recruiting is that much more challenging if, if people aren't coming into the office for interviews. And when we're scaling at the rate that we have to, like it's a bandwidth strain on every manager. And so we've developed a process. My, my colleague, Matt Schreiber, has, has really done a phenomenal job building out this process where first step is a phone screen and every manager or director is, is responsible for getting three to five phone screens across the line a week, right? And then from the phone screens, we schedule group interviews. And in those group interviews, we have three managers and nine to 12 candidates, and it's about an hour and a half to two hours and they have to give an elevator pitch. And then we separate them into a group where they do, they're given a customer use case or a customer story. And then they have to do a group project and present on that. And so from there, we're able to see how they work in a group, how they assert themselves, also how they allow others to assert themselves. And then there's a and a session. And, and since we've, you know, since that works, we just roll with that. We'll have other steps of the interview process so that we can focus on the things that aren't solved yet. So for instance, cross-functional alignment with the field. That's probably something that we'll never take off of our plate. As long as there's new AEs, we have to train them on how to best work with the SDRs, just as we have to train the SDRs on how to work with the AEs. 100%. Okay. So it's an ongoing thing. And then, so what's the, what's the onboarding like for, for these people? So when you get them through the recruiting process, then they come in, yeah. how do you get them up to speed, you know, within the time frame that you need? Yeah. So we have a three week, like standardized onboarding. And in that onboarding, each manager has like a different specialty that they're training on. So we, the lift for each manager, it's not like, you know, when I was at smaller companies, it was like when I was onboarding something, someone, my wife knew about it because I was having to work 60 hours a week because I had to 
do all the onboarding and then also had to do my day job. Well, with this, it's it's a minimal lift for each manager. And then we're leaning on cross-functional relationships. So, you know, someone in the field runs a session. We have people in product marketing that run sessions. And so it's a detailed, we give them the syllabus at the beginning of the week. And it's three weeks. And I think that the, it's important that each week has a different theme. So for instance, one week is going to be simply getting up to speed on the product. You're understanding, you know, customer testimonials, you're understanding competitive landscape, persona-based selling, things like that. Another week may be getting familiar with like the tools. You know, we have Salesforce, we have outreach. And I think that this is an area that a lot of leadership teams miss is they'll do like a 45 minute training on outreach. And then it's like, okay, go on your own. And it's like, man, you could do 45 minutes a day for a month and still be learning new things about outreach. So it's about shifting their attention to the important features. And then the third week is more like account specific and knowing your territory and working with your AEs. And so each week has, has kind of a distinct flavor. And then I think another important component to the training is that it's a mix of classroom setting where we're presenting decks and all that. And then like self-guided education, people learn differently. And so some people are zoning out during, during the training, but if I give them a dense, you know, 10 page customer story, they're able to synthesize that. So you really have to cater to the different audiences and try to keep it fresh. Got it. And are there any tools specifically that you use to do sales enablement with them that, that work well for you or, you know, to house all this stuff or is it most? You talk about like a, what is it? LMS learning management? Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. I think that, so we have, it's, it's an internal thing that's built out that we call base camp. You know, at Snowflake, everything is like a snow pun. So it's either like mountain or <laughs> Yeah, because there's a there's an actual thing called Basecamp. It's like a project management software. Yeah, so I, so they they bring in the snow on everything. Everything's the snow. Reference. Everything's the snow. Okay. You got to be comfortable with snow references. So Basecamp, they are in, we have an enablement org that builds that out, and so we have to partner with enablement org as, as to like curating the right information. I mean, I think that the mistake that a lot of people make with those LMS platforms is that they mistake like the, the objective of it. You know, they think that the objective is to get every piece of information that the SDR possibly needs to know. And I think it's more about curating the right information and making the click paths like logical so that they have, you know, the most important 80% of the material is right there front and center. And then training them on how to use the resource. Additionally, we have something called Mind Tickle, which is like a self-guided school. And you can take all sorts of different modules on Snowflake in Mind Tickle, but we have a SDR specific page on Basecamp. Got it. Okay, cool. So they so it's a combination that it's it's classroom, you know, classroom setting or, you know, I guess Zoom now. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also self-guided education. Does does that mean they're basically out in the wild using it and then coming back to you and you, you know, how it's going. A mix. I mean, there is certain things that are mandated that you have to learn, but you know, if for instance, your territory is heavy in financial services and you're selling into the Carolinas where there's a lot of healthcare and financial services, you may you know, double down on some of the resources that are available specific to those verticals. And so, I mean, there, there's, there's always going to be a healthy mix. I will say, I mean, you bring up a good point as far as like the self guided. I mean, the best SDRs are able to make being an SDR their biggest hobby. And so like for the 18 months that you're in the seat as an SDR, maybe you, you stop watching Netflix, right? And in its place, you read sales books you listen to to great podcasts like your own. You're really understanding the market that you're selling to and the companies that you're selling to. You create the Google Alerts. You, you, you put in the legwork to treat this like an apprenticeship. You know, I'm 36, right? That's how old I am. And so a lot of my friends are, are now becoming doctors and lawyers. 
And I saw what they had to put in to get to where they are right now. And I have that same expectation of SDRs, that they make the job itself their biggest hobby. Such a good point. There's a book called Art of War by Stephen Pressfield. He also wrote one called Turning Pro, you know, and it's like he's got the same. It's not just if you're an SDR, too. I mean, once you become a sales rep, you're, you know, a VP, like, I mean, the constant, consistent, you know, self-education is huge, right? Yeah. The guy that I mentioned that I met on a ski lift that got me my first SDR job, Mike Davis, he's, he's very big on being entrepreneurial with your career. There's a book that I always recommend to SDRs when they're, when they're new to being an SDR. And it's, it's Reed Hoffman's The Startup of You. Mm, okay. And the idea is like, you are the CEO of your own career. And so if you don't have reverence for that, and if you don't treat your own career strategically, you're automatically at a disadvantage. Yeah. And this is even, I mean, for the SDRs that are coming into a, a snowflake, you have professionals like you who are setting up all these systems for their success. A lot of SDRs go in and it's like day one is like, here's your computer, here's Salesforce, and here's the phone, like, go get it, you know? And so th- that that's even more critical, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, for a lot of people going to the earlier stage, it's it's you're left to your own devices. I will say, I mean, there's some benefits to that. I think that a lot of sales orgs, as they get more mature, they over-engineer the enablement to the detriment of the SDR in that they're hand-holding them too much. And, you know, I, I took my son skiing for the first time this weekend. And, like, I it was kind of skiing him. I was like, holding him and barely letting his skis touch the ground. Right. And I know that he's not really going to learn until, you know, he's left to himself. I'll be there obviously. And he's fallen over and he's, he's learning by making mistakes. And I think that that's a, especially with earlier managers is fostering an environment where it's okay to make mistakes, I think is, you know, you look at it for an SDR, it's like you come in and and you're nervous and you have to pick up the phone and you just don't want to screw up. And I think that orgs will benefit more if they celebrate those, those mistakes. So we created a Slack channel. It hasn't been as active lately, but I really liked it where it's called embrace the suck. And it's just a place for SDRs to post some of their less than enjoyable experiences where there's really like pie on their face. And then we can all celebrate it. Because if you take yourself too seriously in this line of work, you'll never progress. Oh, it's too hard. And dude, so what if they come to you and they're just like, look, I tried everything, man. I mean, I've tried everything. And, and they're kind of depressed. Like they've been there for a while. And they're like, I went through the onboarding and I, I'm doing all this stuff. And it's just nothing's working for me. Like, what do you do with that? I don't know. There's, there's two hats that I wear here. One is like the responsibility of, of a manager is to the business, not to the individual. And like, I'm a servant leader. I care about my people when I bring someone on board, like, but you have to look at it from a comparative lens. So, I mean, I try to put as much on their plate as possible. So if they're coming up to me, like shrugging, saying they don't know. Okay, cool. Come, let's set some time. Bring to me the account research that you've done. All right, let's start with that foundation. How well do you know the accounts that you're selling them to? Okay, next, let's see the messaging. And then you can start to drill into like the algebra equation of, you know, how many calls you're making, what's the connect rate, how many emails you're sending, reply rate, things of that nature, and start peeling back the onion more and more. But they have to come to me instead of just shrugging their shoulders and saying, I'm, I'm trying everything diagnosing specific areas where they're struggling. And then I hope through that process that they're, that they're learning a little bit. And then I'll give my energy and experience to, to helping them diagnose the problem. But I mean, so my earlier point on that question, like, you know, the biggest mistake that I made when I was early in my management tenure is that I fell in love with the idea of making everybody successful. And you have to accept the fact that not everybody is cut out for this. And so, you know, it's really eye-opening when you have two people ramping and one person 
right out the gates as your top performer and the other person is struggling, you know, I'm certainly going to put energy into making sure that the person who's struggling is successful. But, you know, the idea of hiring slow and firing fast, my hope is that I've vetted out and, you know, you get better at this over time, the right traits where I don't have to deal with as much the people that are just like at a loss not to ramble, but getting back to the idea of being entrepreneurial with your own career, you know, a core trait is someone that is able to, you know, face that perseverance and come up with, cha- with, with solutions on their own. I'm here to be a resource for them, but they should be the captain of their own ship. Totally. And, and I mean, where do you draw the line at for, you know, as a manager, where you're just like, did have I set them up for success as much as I possibly can? And, and is it maybe the product? I mean, does the product suck? I mean, not in your case, but, you know, does the product suck? Is it the market? Is it the tools? Like, there's so much stuff that you could unpack as a manager to, like, figure out, like, am I setting this person up for success versus they're just not entrepreneurial. They can't figure it out. And I've done everything that I can. And it's like, at this point, it's not me, dude, it's you, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's not lost on me that it's a unique vantage selling for Snowflake. I mean, we just had this massive IPO. We're the bell of the ball. And so in some ways I, you know, having been at those more niche products, selling those more niche products in the past, one of my best friends, the first concert they ever went to was Pink Floyd, the wall tour. And they're like, no concert will ever be the same. And like, in some ways I feel bad for the SDRs that are starting at snowflake because, you know, some of them are going to come to a juncture where they make a move to another company and it's just a lot harder to sell. Right. That being said, to answer your question, you know, how I diagnose, you know, where it's my responsibility and where it's their responsibility. I mean, I think it's important, especially at a smaller organization to have an ongoing dialogue between the managers and the AEs that they support. And then I'm asking the SDR, you know, open-ended questions like, walk me through your day. How are you managing your day? And so it's, I don't know, it's hard to answer the question because there's not like a, a silver bullet. I'm more looking for symptoms of the disease. So for instance, if I'm looking in outreach, a lot of people are going to look at calls, connects, all that. The most important data point in outreach, in my opinion, is overdue tasks. Because if they have a buildup of overdue tasks, it tells me that they're not being strategic and that they're, you know, a passenger in the car, so to speak, as opposed to driving their own strategy. And so I'm going to try to look to these little tea leaves to diagnose where they're falling off. And then, I mean, it's a scoreboard. One of the beauties of being in sales is that it's a make or miss business. And so, you know, I'm going to give them all the resource, all of that, but if they're grossly underperforming right out the gates and other people we bring on board with the same training, the same enablement are blowing the expectations out of the water and start to manage expectations and set, you know, daily, weekly goals for them. And if they start falling off of those, you know, you got to focus on the front end on, on the inputs, activities, connects. So like, you know, I'm not going to jump right to like sales qualified opportunities. I'm going to start on like, okay, your objective now this week is to get eight people a day to have a conversation with you. You could do that by changing the times that you call. You could do that by making a lot more calls. You could do that by changing titles but I need you to have eight conversations. And then once they start having the conversations, then I can start working with them on the messaging. But if they can't meet these basic inputs and other people are able to meet those basic inputs, then we have to start managing their expectations that, you know, maybe this isn't the right place for them. Got it. And so I always wonder, are people born natural salespersons or are they created by training and systems and things like that? Man, that's a million dollar question. I do not think that there is this like sales gene. You know, I do think that it's a, it's probably more nurture than nature. I'll look to, and this is, these are things that come up in the interview process. You know, people are a byproduct of the the people that they surround themselves with. Right. And so I'm going to ramble a bit on this one because it's tough to answer. 
I think that certain life experiences prepares you for a life in sales. So, I mean, the easy cliche one to look to is like, were you in sports? Well, I would take that a step further and say, were you in an individual sport? I mean, if you're a competitive swimmer, then you have to have the discipline to get up early, to get in the pool. It's head to head. You have to have incremental improvements to meet long-term goals. And so some of those life experiences, I do think form someone into someone who's has the aptitude or not. I'll say this. I mean, it's such a hard question to answer because I think sales varies so much from organization to organization. And, you know, there may be someone who is phenomenal, a transactional, small deal size selling environment. They just are cut out for that. And then there's someone else who's more cut out for a long-term, multi-threaded enterprise sales cycle. It's not to say like either one of them is cut out for sales and the other one is not, but there's just a better match for them. And so the person that's the enterprise, you know, long sales cycle person, you throw them in an environment where they're responsible for bringing, you know, I don't know, 12 deals a month across the line. And they may struggle having to manage all of those. I, I don't think sense. I answered your question. Yeah, but. no, I mean, no, that's very, it, it's more subtle than just one or the other, you know, right. and I completely agree. And, and it's like the enterprise person, if you have that gene, you're going to make a lot more money. <laughs> usually. So you're lucky question for you. So I'm also curious about the playbook, right? So the playbook has a lot of different meetings you've got your onboarding plan, you've got these different systems, you're putting everything they need out in front of them. How do you pull all that together? Is it like this big old binder with a bunch of papers in it? Is it online? Like, what is a playbook for you? Yeah, good question. I mean, we, full disclosure, we don't have that challenge solved yet. We've bounced between a few different ideas. I think that the idea of like a base camp where you have like a a actual web page that's user-friendly That's important. But I also see, I mean, I'm the type of person that, you know, I I don't read a Kindle. I read a real book because I can highlight it and I can, I can dog ear pages and things like that. So I think having like a tangible asset that you, in the remote environment, you mail to them. Getting back to my point before, I mean, the mistake that people make is in the playbooks, they try to include everything when really it's about curating the right information. And so less is more on the playbook. I also think in conjunction to a playbook, most orgs I've been at, something that's really beneficial is just like laminated cliff notes, you know, like a one ring, four or five different laminated pieces that breaks into like the key pieces of information so that when someone's new in the role, they have something that they can just, I don't know, have as like a security blanket. So they feel less intimidated. I feel like they don't necessarily use it all the time. It's just the simple fact of having something that's really, really distilled the important, call it talk tracks or ideas that they can just have on hand if they ever find themselves in a tricky conversation. I love that. I love that. So you just like, you can even tape it up, you know, next to your computer. Just if you get in trouble, look over, you got it right there. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and then some of that's just based, I mean, maybe this relates to your question earlier about if people are born salespeople. I mean, there's a certain point in an SDR's journey where they realize that the best answer they can give to a question is, even if they know the answer is, you know what, that's a great question. I could take a stab at it, but you know, based on what you're saying, I think that there's a lot of value in you having a more detailed conversation with my colleague. And if you know that and you know how to punt to the next conference, like that's part of the job. Then of course you still have to qualify a little bit, but knowing not when not to answer the question is, is just as important as knowing how to answer the question. Just pivot, pivot it over there. Last question for you, cross-functional alignment. I mean, that's like the evergreen topic, right? I mean, and, and it's, it's much easier said than done. But how do you, you've got someone on the team who's like in charge of fostering that. How do you think about making sure that 
obviously SDR to sales is aligned and marketing, but you know, the whole thing, right. Cause it's like this huge mess yeah. in some companies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the toughest one to take on. And, and to be honest, the person that we have specialized, one of the best managers I've ever worked with, her name is McLean Corrigan is she's actually transitioning into a SDR ops role because that cross-functional partially because that cross-functional work is, is so demanding, you know, so I'll tackle one at a time. First is the field and you know, half the battle for alignment with the field is getting the buy-in from field leadership. And so you have to start at the top, making sure that we're aligned on, you know, what are the expectations of the AEs? What are the expectations of SDRs? And clearly defining the roles and responsibilities, not to mention like clearly defining nomenclature. What is a sales qualified opportunity? You know, what is the qualification information you want? And that can be tough in a really large organization because, you know, you ask three different regional vice presidents and you might get three different answers. So that alignment piece is something that you got to figure out early on. Then the second step on that is enablement. So this takes the form of onboarding with AEs and having really crisp presentation that, that, that explains it because as you get new AEs, you can't just like train the whole sales org once and then forget about it. You have to constantly be onboarding new AEs into how to partner with your SDR. And so that enablement piece is key. And then the final piece, you know, not the final piece, then another piece is visibility. So do you have the reporting and the data-backed visibility to show the field leadership when the relationship is a little off? Hey, listen, like the rate at which we're scheduling meetings relative to opportunities is 3x in your region relative to others. And here's some specific examples of, of where, you know, I have a hypothesis where we might be breaking down, but let's roll up our sleeves and figure it out. So, you know, you've got the alignment, enablement, and visibility. Then from there, it's, you know, half the job of a sales leader, I think, is identifying what's working and then sharing that with the rest of the org. So when we find a region where that partnership is just just great, we're going to prop that up in an all-hands meeting. And then we're going to try to document in as much of it as possible to supplement our existing onboarding. And so really continuing to iterate on what the partnership looks like. So that's the relationship with the field. Cross-functional relationships, I mean, it's, it's really important. I mean, we're fortunate in the fact that we have a very robust account-based marketing org with a strong leader. And Hillary, my counterpart in, in account-based marketing, like she's going through similar processes that we do with the field, providing us with visibility. Okay, where's the regions where we're getting you know, ABM support, but it's not yielding into results. Okay, let's peel back the onion and figure out what's off there. I think it's pretty standard of expectation setting, enablement, and visibility in both sides of the cross-functional alignment. Both of those. It, man, this is, that's a whole fascinating topic. That we, you know, you could spend a lot of time on. I mean, that's so difficult. There's so much finger pointing, you know, if it's broken, especially from sales to the SDR team, you know, they you know, just sit there and like, my SDRs suck, you know, what's wrong with you guys? Yeah. I mean, I think the finger pointing, it's not productive on any side of it, AE, SDR. And so I try totally. to just like disrupt that as much as possible, but you know, and I'll leave you with this, like we've recently transitioned from rolling up to sales to rolling to marketing. And I was skeptical at first but in time, I've, I've really enjoyed the change because it's eliminated like the adversarial relationship as far as like, okay, why aren't these MQLs turning into SQLs? Instead of it being like finger pointing, it's like, okay, what do we collectively need to do differently to make this function better? And it's much more of like a team environment. Like that. And, and so the comments that you get sometimes is the sales team already hates marketing because... <laughs> Right, they're they're complaining about the leads and they're not doing enough for us. So if you put the SDR org into marketing, now they automatically hate us. Obviously, different at every company, but is there any sort of that vibe where hey, it's called the sales development team, but it reports to marketing? Like, what's up with that? You know, I think a lot of people are skeptical, but I don't know. I haven't seen any dramatic shift. They're still like the SDR is still a critical business partner. 
the generating top of funnel pipeline. I mean, I think from the executive level, it greatly simplifies it in that, you know, part of our one neck to choke. That's, that's a little gruesome, but like if there's something wrong with the pipeline, it all falls on the marketing side of the house. And then if there's something wrong with conversion, I think that that dead zone where SDRs kind of fit in the middle of it, it kind of eliminates that and puts us strictly into marketing. So, I mean, it's still, we're still just two quarters into it, but, but early indications is that it's on um, partnership with field and partnership with marketing. It's made the relationship stronger. Yeah. I've always thought it made the most sense. I mean, it really, you know, but yeah, I mean, still, I think the data was from a couple of years ago, but they, I read a couple of years ago at, I think it was a bridge group that like 70% of orgs still rolled up to sales, which never, it's interesting. I mean, how it's still that very traditional way of doing things and it doesn't really make a lot of sense, but that's the way most companies do it. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, especially at smaller organizations. How do I say this? Most VPs of sales that have gotten to that point are so far removed from generating pipeline that the theories that they have on how to do it are so outdated that it ends up, you know, when the SDR leader rolls up to a VP of sales, it creates a a less than ideal situation. Dude, have you ever thought about joining the United Nations, man? That was the most (laughs) most skillful diplomacy I think we've ever had on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, they're, I mean, if you, if you came up, they're, they're dinosaurs, man. In, in, in 1995, <laughs> right? You know, the games change in the past year on me, right. right? And I live this day in, day out. And so, you know, this is an important thing for sales leaders. The day that you stop learning from your SDRs is the day that you stop being effective. The prospecting game is constantly changing. And so if I ever stop like iterating and learning what the the latest and greatest best practices are from the people that are actually doing it, um, then I stop being effective. And I think that if you have a 15 year gap from when you were making, when you were focused on top of funnel pipeline to now, you're not the right person to lead that strategy. And so by aligning us with marketing, you know, the risk that you run when SDRs roll up to marketing is that the developing of the skills, that talent pipeline piece, it diminishes. And so it takes a proactive effort to make sure that they're not becoming glorified marketers where they're just spamming people, that they're still developing those fundamental sales skills of cross, you know, multi-threaded selling, building value, qualification, things of that nature that are going to prepare them for the next step in their career. Yep. So that's why you got to go back to when we were talking about the onboarding, the playbook, the training, all the stuff that you guys are focused on. This has been amazing, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. You guys are doing amazing things. I I feel like I want to get you back just to talk alignment because that right there opens up, you know, such a huge can of worms, but we'll get you back on the next one to dive into that. Yeah. I appreciate you having me, David, and I'm passionate about the subject. So I'm happy to chime in on any topic. I'm rarely at a loss for words. So I'm happy to help out however I can. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on, sharing your wisdom with us and being on the sales development podcast. So Quinn, thanks again. And we can connect over on LinkedIn. Is that, is that the best way to reach you? Yeah, definitely. The always the best way to reach me is in my LinkedIn inbox. The mail gets buried. Yep. And he's hiring. So get with him and impress him because it's a rocket ship. Great. Thanks, (laughs) Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.